G'day and welcome to The Rest is History. So we are now into our Great World Cup saga and we are turning to perhaps not one of the obvious football nations, uh, but these days a perennial qualifier and that is the great country of Australia. And Tom, I believe for the Australian theme today, you've chosen the life and career of Ian Botham. Is that correct? <laughs> Very good. Yes. Of course, <laughs> uh, Australia's real sport is cricket, not football. No, Dominic, I have not chosen the life and career of Ian Botham. I have chosen the mystery of the Somerton Man, which is okay. Australia's top mystery. Top mystery. Uh, and I, I learned about it when I went to the beautiful city of Adelaide, known as the city of churches probably australia's mellowest city um but also i learned when i was there at this literary festival because they had a whole a whole day of uh, talks devoted to it it has the most extraordinary array of murders that have been perpetrated right. in adelaide so it's a city of churches and it's a city of murders and the thing that struck me about these murders is that um basically a kind of terrible or fascinating or intriguing murder comes along pretty much once every decade and they seem to correspond to the kind of the trends in detective fiction. So, ah, yeah. So, um, in the nineties, when Thomas Harris was, you know, busy with Hannibal Lecter and Science of the Lambs and all that kind of stuff, uh, yeah. you had the, the Snowtown murders. Uh, and Snowtown was a, a place, north, I think, north of Adelaide. But they're also yeah. known as the uh, the bodies in the barrels murder. Uh, barrels for, plural barrels plural because um these are the remains of eight victims that were found in plastic barrels in an abandoned mm. bank vault um very cool, and very, yes so a very horrible story very very thomas harris um and then in the 70s there were the truro murders where there were uh seven women who were murdered by two very unpleasant men had, but and the whole story again when you read it has a kind of real quality of one of those dark kind of dirty harry type films i mean right. kind of noir yeah. Yeah. cops on the edge all that kind of stuff uh, but the most intriguing of the adelaide murder stories is the one that you get in the 40s and this is the mystery of the somerton man which okay. would be a title that you might get say from Niall marsh or marjorie allingham or i guess yeah. dorothy l says or even agatha christie i mean yes. it's that golden age the queens of crime uh, and this is the most extraordinary story and when I heard about it, I kind of became mildly obsessed by it. And I think quite a lot of people who who, who stumble across this story do become obsessed. And in fact, um, towards the end of my of, of this episode, we'll come to to someone who became really obsessed. So, the Somerton Man is named after Somerton Park a Beach, which is uh, about seven miles outside the centre of Adelaide. So, Adelaide is for those people who don't know, Adelaide is whereabouts in Australia? It's, it's South Australia. Right, so, South Australia, and it's the one of the biggest. It's the fifth, fifth biggest. Third, I think. I think it's the third largest. I think after Sydney and Melbourne. I think. Okay, may, may have got that wrong. Um, but not not directly relevant to the uh, no. to the drama and, and Let's not intrigue get of the down story. In, in the size of cities. <laughs> I mean, we're not a geography. <laughs> no. We're not if a geography we were, podcast. Tom, what are we its major pod- industries? What's the name of its river? <laughs> If we were a I mean, geography podcast, I think we'd have been taken off I think we more would. than a year ago. Uh, I mean, we can provide that as kind of maybe supplementary information perhaps later, yeah. but I, I don't have those facts to hand at the moment. Okay. So the story, the story begins on the 30th of November, 1948. Uh, yeah. And of course that is, you know, it, it's the beginning of the Australian summer because they do things the wrong way around there. Uh, and in the evening, it, it's not a busy beach. It's not Bondi Beach. Uh, but, the, right. you know, there's the odd person strolling out and um, there's, somebody sees this man who is lying on his back with his his head propped up against the seawall on the beach. Uh, and the man lifts his arm, waves, uh, and then puts it back down again. So he's clearly fine. Uh, another group of people look down and they see him there and he moves. But they, they do note something which is odd, which is that he's surrounded by mosquitoes, but he's not swatting them away. So... That, that but he is they moving. know that and they think, yeah, he's moving. He's moving. So they think nothing more of it. The beach empties, night comes down, dawn, 1st of December. And there are two jockeys who are practicing riding up and down on the beach. And they see this bloke lying there and they wave to him. No, no response. They gallop up the beach uh, and they come back and he still hasn't moved. And so they get off their horses and they go and look at him and he's yeah. dead. He's dead. Oh. Tom, this is a great story. This would make a great film. 
and he is there he is he's, he's leaning there he's got his head against the seawall and there is a cigarette that has fallen from his mouth onto the lapel of his jacket bear it there are various accounts either it's 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 not been smoked or it's been half smoked right so the various accounts of this and the police come they go through his pockets uh, they find a rail ticket from Adelaide, which is unused. They find a bus ticket, uh, which does seem to have been used. They find a, a comb that's been made in the United States. They find uh, juicy fruit gum, which is also much more available in the United States than in Australia. Um, they find a cigarette pack, an army club cigarette pack, which is very cheap cigarettes. And inside there are more expensive brand of cigarettes. And that's unusual because normally it's the other way around. Normally, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't know, you, hide. Yeah, yeah you so, wouldn't hide expensive cigarettes. No. So that's odd. But what's even odder is the fact that every single label on the item of clothing that this man is wearing has has been surgically removed. There is no wallet. There is absolutely nothing to identify who he is in any way at all. So the police take the body to the, the you know to the local station to the morgue and they uh, produce a report on him. And he is a man who is about forty, early forties, forty maybe up to 45, very good looking man, kind of uh, short hair, slight hint of salt and pepper to it. Very, very well built. Mm -hmm. uh, no calluses on his hands. Uh, so right. clearly not a, a manual laborer. Um, his shoes are beautifully polished, which is very, very strange if he's been walking up and down a beach. Yeah. They seem to have been just freshly polished. So that's very odd. And, and when they look at his legs, his, his, toes are kind of bunched together and he has the the very pronounced muscles of someone who might have been walking either on high heels or perhaps using uh, ballet slippers and so the the person doing the autopsy suggests that he may have been a ballet dancer so okay all very intriguing these are very agatha christie style clues very very so then they do the they do the autopsy and they find that he has a perfectly healthy heart he does have an enlarged spleen uh, so that's, that is something that's wrong. And they find that there is an excess of blood in his liver, in his kidneys, and in his stomach. And this apparently is a strong suggestor of poison. Okay. But they can't work out what, if it is poison, and it does seem to be poison because that's what the excess of blood seems to point to. Yeah, because there's no sign of violence. There's no, no sign of violence at all. Like that. Yeah. But they can't identify what the, what the brand of poison is. So if it is a poison, it's something quite rare and sophisticated. So... They're, they're, they don't know who this man is. Did he die of natural causes? Uh, was it yeah. suicide? Was it murder? And if it was murder, who murdered him? The time of death is pinpointed at 2 a.m. So in the, mor in the morning, so kind of midway between, you know, the people who saw him where he was raising his arm and then when he's found the next morning on the 1st of December. So they don't really know what to do with this. And so they embalm him. They embalm the body to preserve it. Uh, and then they they start looking around for further clues. And of course, an obvious place to look is uh, in the local station, the uh, the cloakroom. They find it in the main station in Adelaide and they find his suitcase. And what they find there, in a way, is as frustrating as everything before. They know that it's his because they find a brand of kind of waxed US thread made in the, in the United States, mm -hmm. which is the same that he'd been using to darn a, a rip in his trousers. So it, it must be his suitcase. There's no correspondence. So again, there's no clue as to yeah. who this man is. No spare socks, interestingly. Very peculiar. Mm -hmm. Again, all the labels have been removed from his clothes, apart from a tie, a laundry bag, and a vest. And on that, on the tie, you get T. Keen. So that's K-E-A-N-E. -E. You get Keen, the name on a laundry bag, and you get Keen, K-E-A-N, on the vest. And so they think, ah. Oh, his name is Keen. He must be, yeah. you know, it's just T. Keen. So they... Obviously, they go through all the missing people, register who might be T. Keen. Not a trace. No sign of anyone T. Keen who's gone missing. So they, they, they try and work out, where's this guy come from? He's obviously come from somewhere. Uh, so he yeah. could have come in. They look at the train schedules. He could have come in from a local town, but they think that's unlikely because someone like that would have been seen. And, and they go to all the local towns and nobody remembers seeing anyone corresponding to this guy. So the only other train that came in was from Melbourne. So they think he must have come from Melbourne. He probably checked his suitcase. He bought a ticket to, to go to the station. Then he discovered that there was a bus going directly to where he wanted, namely to Somerton, that, that yeah. area. So he, that's why he took the bus. So they think that's probably what happened on, on the 30th of November. And the decision of the inquest is that it is likely to be poison. So that's kind of the ruling. They don't know what it is, though, what kind of poison. 
Um, they take a plaster cast of his head and his shoulders, and then they bury him in uh, one of the cemeteries in Adelaide. And basically, it seems like no, no one's ever going to find out who he is or anything. Yeah. But then, then they find a further clue. And this is where it gets really, really Dorothy L. Sayers. Um, yeah. I, I mean, it's, it's so like a kind of 1940s detective story. And do you think we should have a break at this point? I do. I'm, I'm actually on tenterhooks, <laughs> Tom. I can't. I'm greatly looking forward to. Well, it's out it's it's brilliant. Uh, it's an absolutely brilliant. It's it's such an improbable clue that you'd think this could only have been made up in a detective story. But we okay. will. I, I will reveal what it is when we come back from the break. It's exciting. So we'll see you after the break. Welcome back to The Rest is History. Tom Holland, you are taking us through the mystery of Somerton Man. So we're in late 1940s Australia in Adelaide. And Tom, very tantalizingly, before the break, you said you had an amazing clue to reveal. Yes, a further clue. So what is the clue? So the pathologist is going through the clothes of the Somerton Man again, and he discovers right buried down in one of the pockets, the kind of the smallest pocket, he finds a very, very tiny, tiny roll of paper that's been wound up so tightly that he has to use scalpels to extract it from the lining, from the fabric. And he unrolls it, and there he sees printed on it, Tamam Shad. And they Mm, go, you know, Tamam Shad, what what the hell's that? So they investigate, and they discover that it's, it's Persian. So Ali Ansari would have been straight onto it. Uh, and it means mm-hmm. it is done. It's finished. It's 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 over. You know, this is the end. Uh, and it comes from the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, uh, you know, famous Persian poet, polymath yes. from the 11th, yes. 12th century, translated by the Victorian poet Edward Fitzgerald in the, the middle of the 19th century. Yeah. And this this Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam is that is that version. That is so bizarre. Just yeah. those words. Yeah. Tamat Shad. And it's been ripped out from an edition of the of the poet of of, of um Fitzgerald's poems, the Fitzgerald translation. And so the police put out an alert saying, Does anyone have a copy of this book? Could you look and see whether it's been the Tamam Shad has been ripped out from it? And they wait. And in due course, amazingly, someone comes forward and says, Yes, I've got it. Uh, and the story of this man who who doesn't want to be, you know, his identity is kept quiet, is that his car was parked by Somerton Park Beach. And his windows were open because it was hot. Yeah. And he came back, to, you know, having been on the beach, and he discovers that this book had been thrown in through the window. Uh, and he hadn't thought anything more of it. You know, it wasn't anything that particularly attracted his attention. It must have seemed weird to him, though. I mean, yeah, it was weird. Books of Persian poetry through his yes, car windows. Yes, he, he did think it was weird, which is why he kept it and why he remembered it. And it's right. why when, when he reads the announcement, the police announcement, he turns to the, the relevant page and discovers that Tamashad is missing from it, that this is the very copy yeah. And so the police, the police inspect it and they find that there are five lines of random letters in the back. And one of these lines has been crossed out uh, and has been put again at the bottom and they're incomprehensible. And so is it a code? So they, they, they hand it out to all their top boffins, their top code breakers, yeah. uh, and nobody can crack it. And so they wonder, is it a kind of shorthand? You know, is it an abbreviation? You know, what is it? Nobody can work out what these letters mean. But there's more. There are oh. two phone numbers. Oh, this is great stuff. One of the phone numbers is the, the number of a local bank. Okay. But the other phone number is the number of a woman who lives about 400 meters from where the body was found. Oh. And the police keep her name, again, they keep her name secret. But in due course, it comes out that she's a woman called Jessica Thompson, who goes by the nickname of Jess. She's a nurse. She has a small boy, a small son, and she is taken down to the station and she looks at the, bo- the plaster cast uh, and she says she doesn't know him. She has no idea who he is. But according to the, the policeman who watches her, uh, he says that when she goes to see the body, she was so completely taken aback to the point of giving the appearance she was about to faint. Ooh. So that's literally what the policeman says. <laughs> right. She denies knowing who this who the Somerton man is but she says yes the Rub- the Rubat of Omakami is actually my favorite book i love it and i actually gave a copy to uh, to this man uh, who i met when i was working as a nurse in sydney uh, and he was a lieutenant in the australian army a man called alf boxel and so the right. police think well obviously the the dead man is alf boxel case yeah. closed brilliant yeah yeah but then he's found alive so it's not alf boxel so strange. And so that basically is, that is where they end their investigation. So what are the theories as to what's been going on? And there are various theories. So the first theory 
is that the Somerton man was a spy. And this is 1948. I was about to say Cold War. Classic Cold War. Yeah. The Cold War is kicking in. And there are reasons why particularly Russian spies might be interested in Adelaide, because about 300 miles northwest of Adelaide, there is a test range called the Woomera Test Range, which at the time is the second busiest rocket range outside Cape Canaveral. And it's headquarters for an, an Anglo-Australian project to develop V2 technology. So right. you can see why the Russians might be interested in it. Adding to the uh, kind of swirl of paranoia around this is the fact that the mysterious Alf Boxel may well have been involved in, in intelligence. And on top of that, uh, yeah. according to Jessica Thompson's daughter speaking many years later, her mother spoke Russian and was very interested in communism. Oh, my word. The plot thickens. So, yeah, so, uh, you know, no hard evidence there, but enough to, for, for the conspiracy theorists to get their teeth into. Yeah, because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work out what the conspiracy theory here would be. I think Jessica the conspiracy Thompson, theory is that she is the spy. That she's she the is the spy. spy. But who's the dead man? Because if Boxall, has he, has, is the man claiming to be Boxall not Boxall? Well, various theories. Perhaps uh, he is an American agent who's been killed by Jessica. Because he was on her case. On her case. Yeah. Uh, perhaps he's a communist agent who, Jessica's a double agent. Who's, I mean, you know, there, there are any number of permutations. And why the Rubaiyat of, maybe they're communicating through the Rubaiyat of Omar Khan, send each other verses. Exactly. And, uh, and, and another variation on this is that perhaps he was involved in gun running to Israel, which is being, you know, in the midst of being founded at this point. Uh, so wow. perhaps he's involved with Palestinians, perhaps he's involved with the Israelis. So the explanations are very much bred of the, the Cold War paranoia or the, the kind of post-colonial wars that are breaking out in this period. Yeah. But there is another theory altogether, which is that uh, it's nothing to do with spies. It's nothing to do with the Cold War, that it's basically it's a, a doomed love affair involving Jessica Thompson, who at the time that the Somerton Man is found was the mistress of a man called Prosper Thompson, which is where she gets her name from. But she wasn't right. married to him at that point. He, he was a married man at that point. And that, that he only leaves his wife and settles down with Jessica in 1950. And at the time, Jessica has, has this small boy, as I mentioned, who she's called yeah. Robin, who seems to have been born around 1947, and in due course will be brought up as Prosper's son. And Robin Thompson, when he grows up, Dominic, what profession do you think he takes up? It's, it's Australia, so... Um, no, it's most un most un-Australian career. He's a he's a flower arranger. <laughs> no, he's a ballet dancer. He becomes a ballet dancer. Oh, Tom, this is becomes a ballet dancer. Wheels within wheels. Yeah, and this intrigues a man at the University of Adelaide called Derek Abbott, who is an Englishman who's emigrated to Australia, very yeah. involved in electrical engineering. He's a physicist, and he becomes obsessed with the story in the way that lots of people have done. But he, he yeah. is the big Somerton man sleuth. And he, his theory is that Robin was the son of Jessica Thompson and the Somerton yeah. man. And the Somerton man had, had a kind of strange ear, a kind of you know distinctive ear pattern. Right. And oh, I can't remember exactly what it is. He had certain teeth were missing. Robin also had these, he, he had the same ears and teeth. And these are genetic markers. And so the ballet dancing, the teeth, the ears, the circumstantial yeah. evidence that he was born, you know, unknown father. So Derek Abbott's theory is, is that Robin was, was the Somerton man's son. And obviously what he really needs is DNA to, to try and prove that. Hold on. If Robin was Somerton man's son. Yeah. And Somerton man has been killed just a few hundred yards or whatever from where Jessica Thompson was living with his son. Yeah. Then... Somerton man might have been trying to visit his son or something. Or perhaps, or perhaps he committed suicide. Who was who murdered him? That's the question. Again, open question. But perhaps he committed suicide. I mean, perhaps you know, maybe he had a he went to see his son. Jessica wouldn't let him in. He goes off, lies down, takes some poison or something. Perhaps because he's a spy. And this is why Jessica reacts in that way when she sees him. But then, what about the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam and the strange <laughs> message? Indeed, indeed. So Derek Abbott realizes that basically the only way to um, to solve this riddle is is to get DNA. Yeah. What he really needs, he needs DNA from from the Somerton man, and he needs DNA from either Robin or one of Robin's children. And Robin, by this point, has died, but he has left behind a daughter called Rachel. Yeah. And Derek Abbott gets in touch with Rachel, and within a day of meeting her. They're engaged to be married. A day? A day. 
Golly, they didn't mess about. So uh, Derek Abbott and, and Rachel Robin's daughter, Jessica's granddaughter, get married. <laughs> Hold on. I'm just trying to get my head around this. Sort of expert, stroke conspiracy theorist, stroke amateur sleuth. The professor. Yeah. Was he a professor or whatever, whatever yeah. he is? He has now married the possible granddaughter. Daughter of the Somerton man. Of the man whose death he's investigating. Yes. Well, Agatha Christie probably wouldn't put that in, I don't think. Exactly. And they have three children and they're very happily married. Um, oh, that's nice. Love each other very much. And Rachel has joked that uh, he only married her for her DNA. <laughs> so so well, who knows? That's, isn't that why anybody gets married, Tom, ultimately? <laughs> yeah, I suppose. I suppose. But uh, but obviously, he, he so he's desperate to, to dig up the corpse of the Somerton man and extract yeah, DNA. That's a weird thing, isn't it? To be married to somebody and just say, I can't wait to dig up <laughs> yeah, the Don't be your grandfather. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, uh, the the local legal authorities say, no, you can't do it. So what he does is he goes and looks at the death mask right. of the Somerton man. And there he finds various hairs that have been left in the plaster. And he extracts the hairs and he discovers that they, they're good enough to get the DNA. And he, I don't know, whatever scientists do, you'd know, Dominic, they, they work on the DNA. Uh, I love science. Yeah. It is DNA work. Yeah. yeah, he does DNA work. And he teams up with this uh, American genealogist called Colleen Fitzpatrick. And, right. you know, they're operating on the assumption that, that, that Robin was the son of Somerton Mann and therefore the Somerton Mann had had an affair with, with Jessica Thompson. And this is the key to the whole riddle. Yeah. And yeah. this summer, 26th of July, they announced the results of the DNA oh. tests. It was just this summer. Just this summer. And do you think that uh, Robin was the Somerton Mann's son? Um, I want to say yes, but I'm going to say no because no, he wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. He wasn't. So they have now identified. They've managed to identify uh, who it was. They know who Summerton Man was. They know who the Summerton Man was. They're they're kind of a hundred percent certain. It hasn't been officially accepted by the Australian police, but they. I, I've listened to the uh, to the American specialist explain it in very DNA related terms. I didn't understand right. it, but it sounded very very authoritative. So it is a man called Carl Webb. Okay. Charles Webb, he was known as. Uh, and he was the sixth child of uh, an Australian-German couple born mm -hmm. in Melbourne. Uh, and he had a brother-in-law and the brother-in-law's name, Thomas Keane. But you don't normally walk around with a suitcase in your brother-in-law's clothes, do you? No, you don't. So, I mean, there are, I mean, maybe he was short of clothes. I don't know. But I mean, you know, there is that, that is linking, you know, there is a link. There is a definitive link. Okay. Yeah. And he'd been married to Thomas Keane's sister and he'd left his wife in April, 1947. And that was the last record of him. There is no other record of him after that. So he dies, you know, if it is this guy, if it is Carl Webb, he died in, uh, in, on the 1st of December. So, you know, that's quite a, a while where he's gone missing. And in 1951, his wife began divorce proceeding against him on the grounds that he deserted her. And other, other details that we know about Carl Webb, we don't have a photograph of him, but we yeah. know that he enjoyed poetry. So hence the riot. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. And we know that he enjoyed betting on horses. And so uh, Derek Abbott's theory is, is that the, the mysterious code is in fact the names of horses, maybe runners, so he could bet on them or something like that. Why had he cut out all the names in his clothes? Don't know. So th there are lots of mysteries that remain. Why did he have cheap cigarettes and expensive? Don't know. Or the, right, the other way around. Yeah, we don't know that. Why did he have the legs of a ballet dancer? He doesn't seem to be in a ballet dancer. The legs of a ballet dancer. It's like a sort of Greek myth creature, isn't it? The body of a man and the legs of a ballet dancer. <laughs> Did he like wearing What's... stilettos? I mean, you know, we don't know. Yeah, there's no connection with Jessica Thompson at all. Not that they know, no. That that was an absolute red herring. No, well, why did he phone her? Because her, her name was, was, in the, was in the book. So had he perhaps had a relationship with her behind the back of Robin's father and Prosper, whatever his name is? And what about Mr. Boxall? He was a red herring as well. I think he does look a bit of a red herring, but again, we can't right. be sure. We don't know what, you know, what this, if it is Carl Webb, we don't yeah. know what his connection is to, uh, to Jessica Thompson. We don't know why he came to Somerton beach. We don't know what caused his death. We don't know whether he killed himself, whether it was natural causes, whether he was murdered and if he was murdered yeah. by whom, I mean, all of this remains unknown, but, and, and it's, it's so tantalizing. And so yeah. th there's still a huge scope for kind of investigation, but I think that, one of the things that's interesting about it uh, uh, and perhaps suggestive more generally for the historiography of conspiracy theories and sensational murder theories. So I'm thinking of looking at you, Jack the Ripper. 
is yes, that yes. Um, people were attracted towards the most grandiose theories that he was a spy, yes. that he was an American agent, perhaps that he was uh, a refugee from Europe, that he was uh, involved in espionage. I mean, the theories were that had the most currency. And I remember these were the theories that I heard when I first heard this talk in Adelaide about him. They were the most dramatic theories. Yeah, of course. But actually, you know, he's an Australian bloke from Melbourne. And yeah. and when he died, nobody seems to have noticed that he died. I mean, he, he just vanished. But that's very golden age of detective fiction, because in Agatha Christie's book, she would create these incredibly elaborate scenarios yeah. with clocks and with sort of the ABC yeah. murders and stuff. And yet the solution is always very banal and very humdrum. And it's about money or it's about sort of disappointment in love or something. And all of that was a smokescreen. The reality is very kind of mundane. That's the magician's trick, isn't it? Yeah. And you're saying yeah. that with this as well, that, that ultimately... Yeah. And of course, yeah. the interesting thing is that the conspiracy theory is a bread of the political climate of the 1940s. Completely. So they're all about yeah. Cold War anxieties and things. Yeah. Oh, Tom, this is Joe. You know, this is this is the single best thing I've ever heard about <laughs> Australia. <laughs> it's 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 a great story, isn't it? It's a really yes. great story. I'm actually, I think um, we should. I think we should go to Australia, and <laughs> I'd like to go to this beach. And I think not only should we do you know, a, a sort of the trip style in the footsteps of Somerton Man. I think we should try and crack the case. <laughs> <laughs> Sandbrook and Holland investigate. Ah, oh, that's a uh, series, yeah. isn't it? That's Cops on the series. edge. <laughs> Cops on the edge. I'm afraid you'd very much be the Inspector Lestrade figure. And no. I would be the I would I would no. be the tall, angular Sherlock Holmes. You'd be the pipe smoking sidekick. I hate to tell you this. I am Kevin Waitley and you are Lawrence Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Nonsense. I'm John Thor. You're Kevin Waitley. <laughs> well. Anyway, so there it is. And so um I, I I mean I think actually, interestingly, this is almost almost the first episode we've done where we don't you know, it's it's history that as yet is yeah. massively waiting to be written. So we've you know, this this extraordinary development that we've got to this summer, but still so many questions to be answered. Well, that is a brilliant, a brilliant topic, Tom. And I don't think if we if in the rest of this World Cup series we have a story to top that or even to equal it, I will be absolutely amazed. So as you would say, that was an absolute tour de force. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, mate. <laughs> All right. Good on well, you. Well, uh, we shall see you uh I suppose tomorrow for more World Cup themed podcasts. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.